Nathan, thank you for the thank you, kind introduction. Um, I will be walking around, so I need this microphone. A uh, great group, the machine learning uh, seminar. I have to say I learned a lot already. Um, yeah, you see, I've slightly adjusted the title just to realize then, um, so everyone had these great titles. Mine was very technical uh, to realize that it was not that creative. A quick Google told me. <laughs> no problem. Um, I wanted to start with introducing the model, but um, you will see my talk overlaps with um, previous talks and later talks uh, to some degree. So I don't think I have to introduce ChatGPT anymore. Um, but what I do want to stress is that the company behind it is a powerhouse of engineering and also data science. So in terms of relevance for um, this venue here, and um, you will see it's a block blockbuster model uh, GPT. So in the sense that it, it's dozens of people who just worked on the data side be, behind this model, which I think is, is important to stress. And speaking of which, the importance of data science, I should also say when Nathan and Gordon pointed me to the call, um, the, it was not a question, is there one topic that linguistics, so I'm, I'm, I'm in linguistics and um, colleagues and students are, are here as well. Um, there's also lots of overlap. So, um, and just to point you, the question wasn't, is, is there one topic, but which one do I pick? And well, um, cheating with GPT was very prevalent at the time. You, you will see why. So we've already seen some of the impact GPT has had. We discussed some of that on, on the education system. Uh, what I want to briefly show you is Actually, it's performance. This is from the, the paper via um, a website. It's performance in various tasks, including taking the, the bar exam, the legal bar exam, certain SAT tests, maths, biochemistry, whatnot. Just as a pointer, uh, a lot of these tasks are actually lookup tasks, right? We have a vast body of data and GPT efficiently picks the right answers from, from that. To the human, it, the challenge would have been to memorize the data and to, to make the connections. Um, just as a point, also just as a point, other tasks that where it does really well. So, um, sorry, I should have said um, x axis, the, the task, y axis, the, the percent, percentile, how it performs. Other tasks are language form tasks. GPT is very good at that. We, we get to that in a, in a second. There are other tasks creative deeper logic task where you can see like um, advanced writing, calculus, English um, language and literature and coding where there's a, a little bit of a struggle. Well, in my area, linguistics, computation linguistics, um, of course, when the model came out, very fascinated, I wanted to see how does it do on my task, the quizzes I give, the assignments I give, it can certainly help. And um, here is it's a little bit biased because I knew I was grading human and, and AI answers, but you can see GPT-4 is doing actually really, really well on my quizzes. That's what that says about GPT-4 on my quizzes. But um, uh, just to, 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 to show you the power of the model, I, this is one of the assignments. We don't, it's a wall of text. We don't have to go into the details here, but it is a task of giving complex syntactic annotations to, to, to sequences. And hidden in the text, I mean, students really have to read and understand what I'm getting after uh, it, it, to make these annotations. And then I ask ChatGPT, I mean, it starts with, of course, trivial, and, and puts this in this very nice format. And what I want to alert you to, this has not been in the training data. I mean, I know the training data, I know the, the, this kind of data, I asked for something specific, something new. ChatGPT got that and added a column that's certainly not in the training data. So I think this is really impressive and, and also important. Um, the maths, we, we, we saw this, the maths is slightly off, but never mind. Um, so uh, this came up already uh, as well. Is this the calculator moment for the humanities? And um, uh, well, we, we saw it in the panel. I think there's agreement um, that there are similarities. So if you ask me for one sentence takeaway, um, it is this, that um, the classroom, the humanities classroom for sure, is about to fundamentally change. And the question is, well, um, well, one of the questions is, I mean, we need to adapt. And one of the questions is, how much will it change? And I, I think 
the answer to that question depends on the question, where on this curve of AI development um, are we? So uh, X axis time, Y axis performance. And the question is, are we on the lower dot or the upper dot in terms of AI development? We are about to find out. <laughs> um, and depending on that, we have to see how much we, we have to adapt. Now, um, the, uh, this is the, 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 the introduction, the previous background. Now getting to the topic, I um, I will talk about this um, if if I have a little extra time at the end. We'll see um, how I got here, and why I think it's important. But if we want to be able to, to in our classrooms distinguish between AI generated answers and human answers, and there are arguments to be made either side how much we need this, we can well we can say this. So the human eye is not always able to distinguish that, and maybe instructors want to detect usage where they do not even suspect AI usage. And uh, sometimes instructors have uh, their suspicions and they want confirmation. Is this actually AI generated, yes or no? And um, there are detectors for this. Um, in fact, just before the talk, Philippe pointed me to another paper um, that had another great approach, which is um, requiring those models like ChatGPT to watermark the output that these watermarks are invisible to the users and then just seeing is the watermark present or not, which is like fascinating research. Um, this is a slightly different approach. It's really checking for the output. Um, is there any structure we can see um, and pick up on? And there are AI detectors, but um, they struggle at the moment uh, for sure. And um, so existing solutions are being updated. New solutions are being developed. What I um, thought I, I, to do when, when I got, well, I say it, this happened um, on occasion because I think I had assignments turning, turned in using ChatGPT. And so I asked the question from combining previous work with um, ChatGPT, what's, what's coming up here. I asked, okay, can we actually use information theoretical approaches that I've been using in another project? Can we use that for AI detection? And um, you will see it's exploratory work because the end is rather small. But the starting intuition why that should work is the following, because at, at their core, these large language models, at their core, I'm saying this because they're a set of models, but these transformer models, what they do is they're incredibly good next word uh, prediction machines. So we have a sequence, and then the question is, okay, what comes next? And then what comes next? So um, this gives the, the sequences a certain information signature we should see in a sec. And um, I'm saying the information theoretical um, uh, approaches, uh, what I'm using here is surprisal. So it's, it's basically the probability of a token, a word, given a context. And we take the negative log of that probability. And um, this is Shannon 48 canonical paper. And um, other measures work as well. And here, this is the signature I want to talk about um, quite important. So on the, on the x-axis, we see the, the token rank, words, think of words. And then on the y-axis, the information content. The higher, the more surprising, the more information it carries. And then the starting intuition talking um, H0 hypothesis is, that we see different signatures um, from humans versus from AI, right? And so the, the, the intuition behind this is because the machine wants to, it, at its core, really communicate something that is probable, while humans, well, humans do lots of things, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, one of those things is to, to communicate something that is actually surprising, right? That something um, that is interesting. So there are different goals here. Um, I don't want to, there's some relevant literature here. Um, I don't want to, I, I try different approaches. Um, don't want to spend too much time here. One would be okay, humans have smoother information signatures, maybe machines are rougher or the other way around. That didn't quite work. Um, there's a certain channel capacity over a unit of time humans communicate around um, a certain mean. So maybe we can work with that. That didn't quite work. What did work is um, the idea versus higher and lower information content 
on average. And um, to refine that, we, we get to, 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 to that in a second. And so with that thinking in mind, um, um, I designed, uh, put up the following test design. And uh, it's based on a data set from a student. Uh, we've been collecting quiz answers in the classroom. And uh, uh, the student, um, Hannah, uh, then generated AI answers. Uh, I split that into training and test and then used the approach. Um, I might say about this, um, like another word. Um, yeah, the, the approach to, to test this. And uh, I normalized surprisal for sentence length. And then what I did is I asked for linear cut. I, I, I ranked the, the sentences by, by average average information content and then determine the linear cutoff point with a script, which works like this. I come around. It should have started at position zero, really. Um, it's a script that that really just really stupidly shuffles through um, the different positions and then calculates the F1 score. And then at some point it says, well, suck, this is the, the best F1 score. Well, um, so it's a fairly simple approach. Um, it's a starting point. Um, and uh, the, when I say best F1 score, that's not quite all because you can you can say you can take an aggressive um, approach. You can say, um, oh, I want to get all cheaters. You can take a conservative approach. Well, really avoid accusing students of students uh, of cheating. So you don't want to have a single um, false positive in there. And then um, I determined a moderate approach, and here are the results. So. Um, again, the end is rather small, but what I was optimizing for getting a relatively high F1 score, something like 0.92, uh, while at the same time um, uh, not accusing students uh, of cheating wrongly, we don't want that because that destroys trust in the classroom. Right. And um, I said, well, the end is small, but I think in your research, when we, you, you have a strong signal and little data, then you're onto something, right? And um, I think I can show the extra slides. So because of the small n, <laughs> um, I uh, d d d d collected some more data, um, the latest model, some more prompt design, other quizzes, general life questions. I don't want to get too much into the details. Prompt design, well, write such that it avoids AI detection. Be like a 20-year-old student. I threw that out because the answers were just ridiculous. I mean, the it would end on or oh, whatever. I mean, that really just got me. Um, right. And then general life questions. Um, uh, and the detection still works, works really, really well in terms of terms of accuracy. And um, yeah, this is not surprising because at again, at their core, I mean, these models are um. It, it, these these um, prediction machines. But yeah, of course, um, more work is needed here. What I'm particularly interested in is actually, well, we need a higher end, more domains, neural approaches. And then, but what I also, um, looking at really hundreds of those signatures, what I, uh, my intuition is that what happens with the GPT answers is that GPT gets into something that I call like GPT's bloody blah groove. Right, that information tends to be in the first half, and then it kind of just rambles on. So I think there's something to to that too. Great, thank you. I'm I'm almost done. So the outlook, um, maybe I leave this open. This is an arms race. There are other approaches. I think there's something to be said about a semantic approach, really going with the actual answers itself. So if you have a set of questions, GPT tends to pick for a question tends to pick the same answer, even if you ask slightly different way or to um, generate again. And then GPT over your questions kind of walks a path. And the idea is if a student follows that path exactly, well, then maybe there's something, something to, to be said here. Um, we talked about the consequences elsewhere already, so I skipped that. Maybe I leave that for the discussion. Um, what I want to stress here Again, the, we, we talked about the, the relevance of data science and the impact on our lives is that GPT really forced me to think about the classroom, what I want to offer as an instructor, but also as the students. I mean, what, what as a student do you want to take out of, out of, out of a, a class, a seminar? 
And I try to test for deeper understanding, but out of a sudden we have models that can fake deeper understanding, as we saw in the in the intro. So pretty tough. Right. I think I leave it here. Thank you.